you get ready. Have no inhibitions about what God asks you to do. Just go ahead and do it. You know, there was a time in service where we had some folks from Africa that showed up at our service. And they began, when we worship, they just began to jump up and down. So I got up on the platform and jumped up and down with them. It was a great time in the Lord. Uh, they were expressive in their life before the Lord. You know, when we get saved, that's the most amazing thing in our life that can ever happen. Uh, and it ought to excite our lives. It ought to be one of those times that, the way I like to say it, that Holy, Holy Spirit goosebumps run up and down your back. There ought to be something about our lives once we experience that transformation of grace that our lives are never the same from one day to the next. We should keep getting closer and experiencing the Lord more fuller in our lives every single day of our life. It's like I've said before, I, I'm glad I'm not where I was before I got saved. I'm even glad I'm not where I was yesterday. I'm glad that I'm closer to God today. Do you know what? I'm not going to be satisfied there. I'm going to be closer to God tomorrow. And I'm not going to get satisfied there. I want to be satisfied. I want to be closer even more the day after that. And you get the idea of the day after that, and the day after that, and the day after that. There's more to God than what the eye can see and what the mind can imagine. I want your imagination to run wild. I want you to just think of all the things that you believe God can do. Then I want you to think about things that you think God can't do to remember that there's not anything He can't do and ask Him to do that too. You see, we serve a great and mighty God. Amen. And I'm afraid that most of us don't realize that. <coughs> but let me tell you this. <coughs> think about this. If God and the miracle of salvation reached me and reached you, don't you think you can do anything else? <coughs> Think about that. I know where I was and how I was before God got hold of me. And I can't believe he did what he did in saving my soul. And I'm going to tell you, I can't believe what I get to do in the kingdom of God to preach his word. It, it just boggles my mind that I get to stand here and do that. I, I can tell you literally, it just rocks my world. You know why it rocks my world? Because of the power and the transforming grace of God in my life. There's nothing like I've ever experienced before. And if you've experienced this transforming power of God's grace, then you know God reached right down to the gates of hell to get my life and your life and bring us and give us that confident hope of heaven. That's what the power of transforming grace can do. But I want you to realize power of transforming grace literally ought to do that. It ought to transform your life. If you would open your Bibles to Galatians chapter 1. Now if you've got ears to hear, open your Bibles to Galatians chapter 1. Because in your order of worship it says Galatians 5. That's not going to help us at all today. Open your Bibles to Galatians chapter 1. It's right on the screen because I called Vicki and got her to take care of that for me. Because every, every now and then my, my fingers just don't work on the on, on my phone before I do all that. Sometimes the one and the five are close together. So I don't know, but it's Galatians chapter 1. And it talks about the transformation of grace that I see in here. And I want you to find too. So let's pray about that. Heavenly Father, as we think about transforming grace, and we say it's happened to our lives. God, I pray that you would make us realize the power of change that that ought to bring to our life. Lord, it should be that those who have known us, when we said we had no grace, now we have grace, they should be able to see a difference. That those of us, of us who are under your grace ought to realize that difference and ought to excite our lives that you did this for us. 
So, Lord, I pray that you open up our ears. Lord, I pray everybody you have brought here today has ears, so let them hear. Not, not them, don't just let them hear the word, Lord. Let it just go so deep in their heart that they have no choice but to live the word of God out. Or, Lord, this is where we get equipped. Out there is where we go and do the work. So help us leave with more than we came with as we understand this passage of Scripture this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, the exciting thing about Scripture, as we look in verse 11, it tells us an amazing thing. It says, this is Paul writing to the church in Galatia. He said, for I would, I would have you known, brethren, brethren, that the gospel which preached was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Now listen. I think it's in 1 Corinthians 3.16. It said, No scripture is given by the authority of man, but with the Holy Spirit. It says it's foremost from God. In other words, it means it's breathed by God. So what Paul is saying is, I didn't get this from anybody, but it came as a revelation from Jesus Christ. So that's why, why I tell you when I preach the Word, what I'm trusting I'm giving to you is a revelation from the Word that was a revelation to Paul and to all the other writers of Scripture. When I give it to you, I'm giving you their revelation. So all we're getting is a revelation of God. You're not getting the Word of Keith Cameron. You're not getting the Word the, the word of the Apostle Paul, you're getting the revelation that came from God through Jesus Christ and empowered by the Holy Spirit. So this is not me up here waxing, if I could, I don't think I do, but wax el eloquency in giving, and I can't even get that word out, and give you the right word of God. No, it's not me. It's the Holy Spirit. And so, if the Holy Spirit's working through me, then you need to let Him work on you as you hear these words. Now, I, I've got, I know some of you might be where I'm already going to be talking about this morning. So if you think this message, you've already got it down, don't just sit back and relax and wait for uh, it to get to, to lunchtime. Start praying for those around you that they'll hear what God wants them to hear. Amen? Amen. You see, sometimes you're sent, you're sent here to receive something. Sometimes you're, you're, you're sent here to give something. Sometimes you're here to pray for others. And sometimes people are praying for you while you're praying for them because you, all both, you both think you need the same thing. Mm -hmm. So if they don't see, if you don't see each other, pray for each other that you've got this power that's transformed your life through the grace of God because it comes by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now this is Paul says, For I never received it from man, in verse 12, I was taught it, but I, I, I was not taught it, but I received it from the revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard in my former manner of life in Judaism how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and try to destroy it. Now, this was his life. He sought after the church of God and tried to destroy it. This is not the guy who you would check off on a resume. I think that I want this guy to be the pastor of our church. <laughs> he sought the church of God to destroy. This was his life. He goes on to say, I used to he, he, he persecuted the, the church of God beyond measure. I mean, he, he tried to excel in that. He gave his best effort toward that. He really tried to bring down the church of God. He said in verse 13, For, for you have heard in my former manner of life in Judaism how I used to persecute, this is verse 13, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and try to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen being more extremely zealous for my ancestral tra tra traditions. He said, you know, even where I was, he said, I was a go-getter. He said, I was extremely zealous for my traditions. In 
in some Baptist churches, though, do you know what traditions are? They're just the chains of the past keeping us from going forward. Wow. Do you hear what I'm saying? Yes. That's what traditions do. And he was looking at spiritual, religious traditions coming out of Judaism. And when he began to come into to, to a relationship with God through Christ and become a Christian, he had to let those chains go because they hindered his life. Now, I'm going to tell you, if you come up to me and say, Pastor, we don't need to be singing new songs. I can tell you about the psalm says sing new songs. And 2 Timothy 3, after you get past what Paul said, he said, sing hymns, spiritual songs to one another. So you got to have hymns and spirituals. we got to do it all, folks, to celebrate who God is. We can't let spiritual traditions hold us back. Now, someone asked the other day, what Bible was I preaching out of? Well, I preach out of the New American Standard. You know why? I love what it, and if you hear me quote something, it may be out of King James, but I don't speak 1611 English anymore. I don't think I ever have. This is, you know, I have a hard enough time reading this, much less reading King James English. And so I want you to know that, that I'm going to give you the truth of God's Word. It may not sound just like yours. If it does, just get one like mine. We'll be okay, all right? It goes on to say that with that. He was advancing in Judaism beyond many of his contemporaries uh, among my countrymen. He said, I was, above, I, I was past everybody, and I was more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. But when he who had set me apart, even from my mother's womb, called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me that I might start preaching among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with the blessed prayer. Now, your pastor doesn't do a whole lot of reading outside the Word of God. But I came across a statement a couple of days ago that Mark Twain had said. He said there's two important days in a person's life. The day you're born, then the second day is realizing why you, what you were born for. Now, all of you said to me before you were born, are born, I see you. you. You popped out of somebody's womb and here you are. And guess what? Have you determined yet why God brought you into this world? I don't know how Paul brought all this together, but he was an extremely zealous to destroy the church. He was extremely strong in his Jew, in the traditions of of, of, of the Pharisees is what it was. They really weren't biblical traditions. He was strongly indoctrinated with others. He was zealous past his countrymen. And all of a sudden, God gets a hold of him. And then he realizes he's supposed to preach the word to the Gentiles. So he knew he was born on a particular day. And now he realizes what God prepared him for. My question is for you this morning. Do you know what you've been prepared for? You're not here by accident. You're here on this planet by God's divine plan. Nobody was birthed into this world that God did not want birthed into this world. Do you understand that? You're here today because God said I want you in my kingdom. You know, we sang a song a moment ago about uh, uh, our mansions in heaven. That, that was kind of in that song, right? Y'all remember that song we sang about that? Because I thought about it we sang, I don't care about a mansion in heaven. Because you look in the Gospel of John, he says, I've gone to prepare a place for you, a mansion. I don't care that you and, and, and mine it says the dwelling place. Just a place to hang, to, to lay down and go to sleep is all I care about. 
just for the Jews. It's for the Gentiles. That means it's for us too. And some of you have encountered that. Some of you have not. I don't know. You know, you don't know that I have really, do you? There are a lot of guys who stand up in the pulpit and they don't even know who God is. They just can look at the Word and and they can pull a pretty good message out of it. And they can tell you how to prosper so they can fill their own pockets. That's not me. I want you to know Jesus and have a relationship with him. But he knew the day he was born. And then he knew what God wanted him to do. He said, God has called me uh, uh, to preach him among the Gentiles. And I didn't consult the flesh and blood. He didn't go up to Jerusalem and say, how how did I do this? He went for three years and just stayed before God and asked God, how do I do this? Uh, What do I say? And and then after three years, he went back and he he met Peter and he got introduced to Ralph. But he just kept preaching. He didn't preach according to them. He preached according to what the Lord told him. I've told people before, I can preach in any denomination that's out there as long as they let me preach the word. Because I don't preach because I think it's Baptist doctrine. I preach it because of the word. If I was in a Methodist church, I wouldn't be preaching because it was Methodist doctrine. I'd be preaching it because, because it's the word. If I was preaching in the Church of Christ church, I wouldn't be preaching their doctrine. I'd be preaching the word. Because some of the things we got in our covenants and in our Constitution bylaws, sometimes they just don't match up with the Word of God. And so I'm always going to hold before you the Word of God because it's the only thing that matters in our lives. That's why I prayed earlier. Lord, let us have ears to hear it and, and hearts to live it. Amen? We've got to live the Word out. Just to know the Word's not going to help you because it, we, we have one of those old songs that say, Trust and obey. If you know what the Word says and you don't do it, you're still guilty of sin. Did you know that? Because you're living a disobedient life. It goes on to say, I didn't consult blood, uh, flesh and blood, nor did I go to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. But, but let's see the power of this transfer, transformation of grace that allowed him to wholly lead on who Jesus is. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12, he says, I thank Jesus Christ our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me in service. Even though the woman now is a blasphemer, a persecutor, a violent aggressor, and yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly and unbelief. And the grace of the Lord was more than abundant with faith and love which are found in Jesus Christ. It's a, it's a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came to this world to save sinners among whom I am chief of all. He said I was persecuted. I was violently aggressive. And his life became one. He was willing to sacrifice his life for Jesus Christ. You know the Apostle Paul? He was, he was beaten, I think, at least nine times. He was, uh, he was stoned. He was left outside the city for dead. Uh, he just had so many things that went against him. And all he did when he got up and got his wits together, he started preaching Jesus again. He didn't let anything disturb him. Why? Because the same zealous he had as a, as, as a Pharisee, God took it and used it for his kingdom. Now let me ask you again. He knows where he came from. And he knows where God brought him. I think that's why he stayed so so strong in the midst of all the turmoil of his life to say, yea, God, I'll go through this. He never backed down. He kept going forward, even though he was persecuted, he was laughed at, he was scorned, he was debated, but he never lost the debate because he trusted in the Holy Spirit. He 
His life changed dramatically. That's the power of transforming grace, that your life changed dramatically. You know, I was probably one of the, I, I could cuss worse than a sniper. I had more anger in my life because I enjoyed expressing my anger. When God came to me and said, I want you in my kingdom, he didn't tell me, me, me immediately ask one priest like he did Paul. But he came to me and said, two things you're going to have to give up. You're going to have to give up your language. You're going to have to give up your anger. You know those things are no longer, since that day have never been a problem to me. Unless it's one of my grandchildren from time to time. I do have to confess that because they get awfully light from time to time. And I have to get them quiet down or I'm not going to be happy with them. So I just get them calm down. I use inside voices. I don't yell at them. I never will. It doesn't make sense that God would take any of us and want us in his kingdom. Look where he took Paul from. Paul knew how far he had took him. How, how much he had to clean up to get him ready to do what he wanted him to do. He had to change his heart and his direction. In your transformation of grace, has God changed your heart, your mind, and your soul? Have you surrendered your strength to Him, your heart, your soul? Your mind? Have you done that? Do you love Him that deep? That's what I'm asking. Because if you don't, I don't think you've had a transformation. That may startle you. But I'm telling you what the Word of God says. Shows he takes a person from where he was, brings him to where he is, and then because of it, he's willing with his whole life to walk before God, regardless of what it costs him, regardless of what the sacrifice is, regardless of the pain and suffering he goes through. There's one place that Paul says, Join with me in the fellowship of suffering. You know, that was part of his Christian life. How many of us are going to volunteer for suffering? If you know grace like he knew it, you will. You will. I'm asking you. Do you really know that you've experienced from God the power of transforming grace? Or do you just walk the mile and take the pastor by the hand and say, I believe. The pastor said, I'm glad you do. Let's get baptized. Listen. If you're alive, when you went in that water, came out of that water, when you shook that pastor's hand and then walked out that door, and your life hasn't changed. You don't know what I know. You need to know the power of transforming grace in your life. By grace, we are saved. And grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. Did you know that? He did something else we could not do for ourselves, but he was willing to do it for us. My question, do you really know where you were when he took you and brought you in the kingdom? And let me ask you, are you way past that now? Are you way past where you were? I mean, some of you have been saved 50, 60 years, right? Are you way past where you were the day you met? Or is your life kind of looking in the mirror and you know you're the same person you were? And Satan slipped you a count. He made you think going to church got you saved. Going to church won't make you a Christian no more than walking through the garage makes you a car. Listen, you've got to have a real encounter with God to make a difference. You have that real encounter with God, it's going to change your life. You're never going to be the same. Your heart's going to change, your mind's going to change, your want to's are going to want to change. You're not going to be the same old person you were. Because therefore, being man in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. The old, old things are becoming new. You're becoming new in Christ. You're growing day by day, becoming more like him. And if any of us, including me, if we think we're there yet, we fooled ourselves and we're being deceived again. There's more to God than we've been able to capture yet. But one day we will when we see him. Amen? We'll capture that. But we keep pressing toward that mark of the upper call of God in Christ.
Christ Jesus. That's the challenge of our life. And we do it with all the zealousness that's with us. We do it with, with a, as it were, a violent aggression in us that says, let's push forward to get to know God even more. That's our heart. The believer, if we really believe, because again, you know where you were when you met grace. You know how far God had to get you to come to grace. He had to get past all your sin. He had to get past all your idols. He had to get past all your selfishness. He had to get past everything. All your rebellion. You know, disobedience to say no to God. You know what the Bible says that's equal to? Equal to witchcraft. The reason I say that is hard to say divination. I didn't even say it right now, I don't think. But it means witchcraft. Disobedience before God is equal to, to witchcraft. We need to be careful, folks. We've got to be sure of who we are. If you have met the grace of God, there's a power there to transform your life just like it did the life of then you're going to know the voice of God. Then you're going to know the purpose of God. You're just not going to know if you were born. You're going to know what God wants you to do when you ex experience the power of that transforming grace. Again, it doesn't happen because you walk down an aisle. It happens because you surrender your life to God, repenting of your sin, seeking His forgiveness, and declaring Him to be the Lord of your life and living that Lordship out by trusting and obeying Him. And if you obey Him, you're going to have to ask Him to forgive you for things He told you to do that you didn't do. You know that? Just to know His power. You've got to walk in the fullness of His grace and every day commit that day unto the Lord to faithfulness and righteousness and holy and purity and morality. Do that so you can be the child of God knowing the purpose of God that He has. Just in case you don't know, He said, look out into the field or white in the harvest. Pray unto the Lord of the harvest, he'll send workers into the harvest. The harvest is all those people who lie are captivated by people. We're to take the light to them so they can see their way out and come to God. We are called to go out there and turn this world upside down like those original apostles did as they kept their life committed to the Lord. So what are you doing if the grace has came into your life? If you stop the transformation process, pray for God to restart it and get you going again so we can be about the master's business. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, I believe that in myself there are shortcomings that have kept me from doing what I need to do. Lord, there are shortcomings in all of us to keep us from doing the things that the Spirit of God leads us to do. So, Lord, let the Holy Spirit start in me and then start in the rest of us and show us what we need to let go of so the transforming power of grace can be stronger, more evident in our lives so we not only know that we were born, but then we know why is to serve the King of kings and all the Lord. So Lord, speak to us this morning. Call us to the city.